Our goal was to create the greenest car in the world and put one in every driveway in the world. And we took the car outside and we couldn't get down the driveway. I think a lot of guys are being uh, modest here and uh, underestimating the capabilities of what this vehicle will do. Well, someone is going to make a car like this because uh, the world just has to start using less energy. Oh, my word. That is amazing. Uh, where this idea came from is... Um, probably when I was young, like really young. At grade 10, I don't know why, but um, I just wanted to be an engineer. I graduated from the University of Manitoba in 1974 with my degree in mechanical engineering. By then I was totally infatuated with cars and determined to design a better kind of car. When I got my first real job um, as an engineer, it was at Versatile. And I remember saying to myself, there were big four-wheel drive tractors, big engines, a cab. And I remember thinking to myself, um, close enough. I live in Winnipeg. Uh, if you want to design cars, there's no car companies here. Close enough, right? Although I had dreamed of designing a better urban automobile since my university days, it would take me over 30 years to actually start building. My ideas developed and changed a lot over the years. By the winter of 2009, Blaine McFarlane, John Vukelik and I began to meet at my shop in Winnipeg's West End and to really get serious about building the world's greenest car. Okay, so here's John. This is the electrical. Oh, great. <laughs> January 2nd, 2009 is when we started our Monday nights working on the Irby Car Project. I heard about Jim before that. He was a designer on several tractors uh, for the company that I was working for. And I heard a lot of good things about him, so I was curious to work with him. I don't know, we just talked like this for <laughs> week after week, go out for dinner. They started saying, when are we going to work on the car? But then we decided, because it's a woodworking shop, that the next step indeed was to make a wooden mock-up of the car. At the beginning, it was just three guys getting together Monday evenings and, you know, cutting some plywood and seeing what we could come up with. When I see a Honda Accord, I don't ever think I could do that. But we did know that a group of 12 can design a tractor. If we can design a tractor, then we can design a car that is like a tractor. And then that just so happens to align with the kind of car I would like, or I think is necessary or needed. Here's the wooden mock-up of Ruby an early model of Ruby. When I first saw it, I thought it was very well thought out. Anytime I threw a question at him, there was a, a, a real answer behind it, not one off the cuff. It was thought through and thorough. So I thought, I'd like to see where this goes. Today, I th when anyone asks me why I'm doing it, I say I'm doing it for my kids, and I think it's... You know, there's seven billion of us on this planet, and we're all taking more than our fair share of what the Earth can sustain. Over the first eight months of the Monday night meetings, Irby developed and slowly began to take shape. We went from wooden mock-up to go-kart to stainless steel chassis. And as Irby morphed and grew, so did our group. Jim's a long-standing friend of mine, and uh, for many, many years we were talking about how dissatisfied we are with the choices of cars available to us, so we decided to do it ourselves. I got involved uh, uh, many years ago when I uh, walked in the door uh, core product design and, uh, and got a job uh, working for Jim. Uh, over the years we uh, developed uh, 
couple uh, human powered vehicles and uh, both of those led to uh, Irby. Jim was interesting. We, we, uh, we spent a lot of time uh, talking of course for the first, uh, for the first bit and uh, he explained his background and he explained uh, the background of, of Irby and uh, I guess uh, other vehicles that they've designed and where they've come from. So, uh, so yeah, we hit it off pretty good right from the beginning. I met Jim uh, oh, 20 years ago when I first came to the city. I had read about his company at the time, they were doing human powered vehicle projects and I went there and said, hey, I'd love to work for you someday. What's amazing is that he took that, instead of just talking about it and going, yeah, you should do that one day, he stuck with it and he made it happen. He, he did the development work, he persevered, he educated himself in the areas that he needed to be educated in and attracted the group of people that he needed to attract to make it happen. The philosophy is also to not only build an efficient car, but a car that lasts a really long time. If you do something once well, then you don't have to do it again. I think we're, uh, we're all kindred spirits. We're all um, inquisitive. We're all trying to figure out if something can be done a better way. In the fall of 2009, we discovered a multi-million dollar competition for innovative automotive design called XPRIZE. This is a race for our future. It is a race we must win. We knew from the beginning that competing in XPRIZE would be a very difficult challenge for us financially. But it was also an unbelievable opportunity for us to showcase our design. We started hearing about this competition uh, to design the 100 mile per gallon automobile. And the competition was open to anyone in the world. We started talking about it, but the deadline for application was coming up quick. I don't know which team we were to enter, but if there were 111 teams, maybe we were the 111th. <laughs> but I don't know that, but I know we were late. Just the $10,000 entry fee was a tough one. and. Uh, how did we do it? Well, I guess we just decided it would be the, the right thing to do at the time, and um, uh, one of us needed to step up, and I did with the 10,000 bucks, and, and on you go, right? And then you're committed, you can't go back. For the mechanical side of it, like some of it is in Jim Shuchuk's court, some of it you know, would come back into your court, mm -hmm. and, um, and some of it would be in my court yeah, to get, get the sheet metal done, you know? Our industrial designers, Terry and Dave, worked on the blueprint for the body of the car but we still faced a host of other challenges for the first Irby prototype. Uh, this is the, the motor that will, um, electric motor that will drive the right front wheel and then we have another electric motor that drives the left front wheel. And then the gas engine, just for this first prototype, but uh, the gas engine is driving this front wheel when you're just on the gas engine. And these then are typically stopped. We had a uh proved out drivetrain which uh, was developed by tractor designers so you knew it was going to be indestructible. We had done an incredibly thorough job of the concept and we had this uh, group of people that could do it and we had a pretty simple design. Over the next few months we doubled our efforts on Irby. We managed to survive two rounds of cuts in XPRIZE and make the final 30. But more often than not, XPRIZE seemed like mission impossible. It was intimidating for me because I'm one person doing the electrical system. Just trying to track down all the hardware. And now I'm entering a competition where I have to go up against some very smart people. Yeah, it was nerve wracking. How long do you actually need it charging overnight? Is, is eight hours enough to recharge this pack? Maybe there were teams with less money than us, but it felt like, uh, we felt like the bottom of the runt litter, you know. And uh, uh, to the China team, which we don't know if this is fact, but we had heard or read or something, it was close to 40 million. 
We had very little money and only a few loyal sponsors. But what we did have was a very dedicated group. By this time, Blaine, John, Dave, Terry, and I had quit our day jobs to work full time on the car. <laughs> One of the first priorities for our designers was to bring the wow factor to my original sketches, which were based exclusively on physics and had little or no style. I'll remember staring at that teardrop and saying to myself, what on earth am I going to do with that thing? <laughs> After their initial sketches, Terry and Dave constructed a scale model of Irby from clay, where they carefully refined their design. To get the clay model into the computer, we, we, uh, Dave contacted a company called Tebas in Michigan and very quickly uh, decided to take it down there to have it scanned. So this is what you're looking at is the first rendering of, uh, of our vehicle. This is the first look before anyone else has seen it, what our car is going to look like in the end. Oh, it's just stunning. It's uh, spectacular. When I was down in Detroit, we finished scanning and we entered into the computer and we were test fitting it the first time and we looked at it and we said, that's it, it's perfect. All the roll cages, everything was inside our body and lined up perfectly where we wanted it to. So it was exciting for everyone. And uh, we're talking about guys who have worked with uh, BMW, Mercedes, Porsche, uh, Pininfarina, like all the top car companies. And they looked at our car and said, that's cool. Irby's body design was coming together but the deadlines for XPRIZE were looming. While some of our competition had logged thousands of miles on their vehicles, we still hadn't completed a single test drive. The XPRIZE demands that uh, we put 100 miles on within six weeks from now. And um, without question, we're hopeful that they're late. My name is John Vukelik. I'm one of the volunteers working on the Irby Car Project. We are part of the Progressive Insurance Automotive XPRIZE competition. This is our Where We Are At video, uh, part of the requirements for the second technical deliverable. We were a day or two away from that date, and we had just welded the chassis, and now we were trying to get it to run. And we took the car outside, and we couldn't get down the driveway. And we started pushing it, thinking that uh, there was just too much load on the motor. And I remember we pushed it down the street, and then we pushed it back and parked it in the garage. And I had never felt so low. <laughs> oh, it was uh, it was rough. Well, the reason there was so much apprehension is, you know, we had just sp spun the wheel for the first time. Uh, and, and usually you just don't go that fast. You don't go driving 100 miles. <laughs> you know, in any sane uh, testing, you know, you would, you would, you know, you would spend a day, you know, just a little bit here and a little bit there. It's risky. I mean, when you, when you rush, when you're designing and you rush, you're taking chances, so... I was, I was pretty nervous about the whole thing. I didn't want anyone to get uh, hurt. As expected, we got off to a rough start at the beginning of our initial test run for XPRIZE. But with the clock ticking, we had no other option but to complete our 100 miles by the end of the day. It just started coasting down. Mm -hmm. Just start slowing down. Did you down. get it onto the gas motor? Yes. Well? You did, eh? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. And what did you do with the, the, the uh, throttle for uh, the electric? I, I, I pulled the power for the electric so I was running straight on gas. Yeah, I thought we decided we had to have the electric motor going. Continuously? Yes. That's what we said last night. I we just off. turned it down though. We didn't you, shut it off. You didn't shut it off, but you shut it completely off when you pulled that alligator clip off. I did. Yeah. yeah. So try leaving it on? Try leaving it on? Yeah. yeah. I think we did seven or eight laps, seven or ten miles per lap, and we hit maybe 70 miles and then got our 100 miles. It was very nice. 
Congratulations. First test driver of the Irby car. Nice. <laughs> By completing our 100-mile test run, we qualified for the next stage of XPRIZE. But we were missing key components on the car, and every day of XPRIZE we slipped further behind and deeper in debt. The time had come to make a decision whether to continue in XPRIZE or to withdraw from the competition. We didn't have a body. We could not compete without a body. That wasn't going to happen at that time. We hung in there as long as we could. And when we decided to opt out, um, I think we were pretty unanimous. We entered to design a car, and then you're doing all everything else but designing a car. It was supposed to be a, a competition for innovation, uh, and it ended up being a competition of rules, uh, rules and regulations. We talked a lot about whether we're designing the car we want or for Expo. It was a struggle, but we, we zeroed in that it's going to be the car we want. So not designed specifically to win a contest. As a result of XPRIZE, we started to attract even more attention from the media. Good. Uh, turn uh, that way. Okay. Not just from the local media outlets, but national media as well. In July of 2010, we were contacted by the Discovery Channel to be featured on Daily Planet. We were somewhat surprised by Discovery's interest, but we headed up to Gimli Racetrack that day to show them what Irby could do. We drove it around the track and we did some pylon tests and uh, excelled to uh, some decent speeds, proved out the rear wheel steering one more time for the camera. I was reluctant to show what we were doing. You know, uh, I didn't think it was impressive. But all of us thought, well, <laughs> anything can happen, right? A wheel can fall off. I mean, you know, and of course, then uh, there was no comfort from the producer of Daily Planet because he says he just loves that kind of stuff. <laughs> Melt through and touch one of these though, like that. If that touched the cable yeah. and then touched the ground, oh, right here. We're thinking one of the wires might have rubbed through and made contact with one of the battery posts. Shorted out. Fixable by parade time, do you think? Yeah, I got some extra cable. Okay. I guess now we're at a stage of confidence that we know that our our vehicle is stable and runs well. Um, there's a lot, a lot of work to be done still, and we basically need uh, more support to get it to the next stage. The day of the parade, that was Dave's idea, and it was a great idea. And at first, I remember it was met with some resistance. Even I thought, a parade? What are we doing in a parade? The parade that we attended was, uh, was a Shriners parade for a safe cruise parade. So they do it every year uh, to, uh, to try to promote safe cruising and safe driving. And of course, we didn't know for sure how far Irby was going to make it in the parade. This was the first major test for our electric motor, and we knew we were pushing beyond its capacity. It's the electric motor that failed. Maybe one of the carbon brushes gave out. The motor is only rated for six kilowatts. It's not the final motor for the design. It was just one we had from when we started, so we thought we'd give it a try. I'm amazed it made it over the bridge. Uh, I'm amazed how far we made it. This, this is honestly uh, surprising. <laughs> you can't blame it for breaking. So I think it was an excellent ride. It's unfortunate that the, that the motor went, but uh, I mean, for the first test run on city streets, it was amazing.
We live at the bottom of an ocean there, and we don't really visualize it that way. You've got to think of the air as a clear ping pong ball going up about 60 miles. So think of uh, like those uh, play pens at McDonald's. Well, think of those as crystal clear ping pong balls. And they're here right now, and cars driving at 70 mile an hour, these ping pong balls are just going all over the place. <laughs> With commercial automobiles, manufacturers and consumers have expectations for what cars should look like. Those expectations are driven by budgets, existing designs, and even personal preference. And they certainly are not required to follow the principles of aerodynamics or minimize energy. We went about the design a little bit different. We started from, uh, from nothing, from scratch, and we, uh, we said, what's the most efficient way to design this vehicle? If it didn't need it, it didn't have it, and, uh, and we continued on until, uh, until we got the shape we wanted, which met every single aerodynamic principle. Our car, to any aerodynamicist, would make sense. There's the blunt nose, there's the smooth bottom, there's the wheels that poke through with, with no, not giant holes, but just small grooves. We were happy with the design, and uh, it turned out even better when, uh, when we sent it for aerodynamic uh, testing and simulation. Right from day one, uh, Jim said that it needed to be a, a coefficient of drag of uh, 0.15, which is uh, unheard of in a passenger vehicle. Almost a year of designing the vehicle, we sent it in for testing, and we got uh, got the results of it's between 0.148 and 0 0.150. We're ecstatic. Being technical types, we're, you know, we're reluctant to be too aggressive with our claims, but I think one claim we can make is it probably is the most uh, aerodynamic, practical car, I do think that's correct. Okay, this is a door panel that, uh, that I'm working on, and uh, we're going to be printing this door panel. Computer software tells the machine the precise shape we want, and then we literally grow the part in three dimensions. The process works very similar to an inkjet printer except the tip is like a glue gun that extrudes a very fine bead of melted plastic. The glue gun starts with like a roll of spaghetti of plastic, and it's only like 15 thou thick and 30 thou wide, so it's very tiny and precise, and it just keeps working away, gluing the glue to itself, and out come completely finished parts. You saw this? No. Okay. To ensure that the body panels would fit together properly, we first had Stratasys build a scale model of Irby. Based on the confidence of these parts fitting, like we made this scale model to make sure that the files, the computer files, were correct. So based on these parts fitting exactly, we gave the go-ahead to make these in full scale. I spent uh, a few weeks finishing it and getting it into uh, paint and looking like the real vehicle. And once I got that, it was just, it was amazing. This is tough stuff. This stuff is, uh, is going to last, and, uh, and it did. It's, uh, it's been through a lot now, and I think it's tougher and more durable than, uh, than using uh, metal panels on, uh, on this vehicle. This process has certain rules, but compared to fiberglass or sheet metal, stamping sheet metal, you know, it just seems like anything goes. You know, whatever you can imagine. I think it was the only decision. When you look at it uh, all put together, uh, it looks simple, but uh, I can't imagine designing a more complicated uh, item or product. Something magical happened once we saw the completed scale model, and we knew then that we had something very special. It allows us to get these exact panels fitting perfectly like they do in a car. And if we change our mind, we just change the software and we grow another fender. <laughs> so we're going back? Although we were quick to recognize the unlimited potential this process presented for Irby, what we didn't know at the time was that the decision to use 3D printing was about to put Irby and our team center stage at the biggest car show in the world. That looked good, Blaine? On this side? Okay. <laughs> In the fall of 2010, we were invited to Las Vegas for SEMA, the world's largest annual car show. Tebas, the Michigan company that produced our computer model, 
wanted us to be part of their booth at SEMA. I've been going to SEMA since uh, since about 2000, 2001, and uh, it was always one of my goals to, uh, to have a car at SEMA. Needless to say, we were ecstatic to be invited to SEMA for the opportunity to show Irby to a captive audience of automotive companies and enthusiasts. But at the same time, we were under tremendous pressure. The trip to Las Vegas would be expensive, money that none of us had at that point. And we were facing another impossible deadline to have Irby ready in time for the show. I remember Jim Shuchuk says, when you're in a project like this, he used to watch those Western movies where to, to show time passing the calendar, you know, rips off. Yeah, you remember those? <laughs> well, like when you're in these kind of projects, that calendar just roared off. <laughs> <laughs> the deadline for SEMA was looming, and we were starting to get very anxious about how people would react to Irby. So it's our first taste of what Joe Public or, or Joanne Public you know, feels or thinks of this car. And of course, the worst case scenario is no one even comes into the booth or they go, Jesus, what's that? You know, that kind of thing. Six of us made the trip to Las Vegas and that first night, we held a meeting to discuss what we wanted to accomplish at SEMA. We're all comfortable with, with at the booth, how, how we're going to talk, or...? Uh, it's just the lead-in, like, uh, you know, how do you start with these people? <laughs> I, I don't know. I just remember going in trying to think, what are we here for? Like, we spent a lot of money to get here. We're in Las Vegas, we've got six guys there. We've got to take something away from this trip, and, and what are we trying to accomplish here? Just a year earlier, some of us had come to see the SEMA show as spectators. And now, here we were, about to show Irby off to the world. If you look at, uh, at where we were last year at this time, when, when I said to Jim that uh, we're going to be here next year in this booth, <laughs> and uh, I wasn't too sure if, if I was joking or if I was serious about that, but uh, I mean, we've come a long way and here we are in, in SEMA a year later and we're probably the first car from Manitoba to be in the SEMA show. Irby still wasn't finished, of course, so we still weren't even allowed to call it a car. It's a car. Uh, it's, a, it's a rolling display under a thousand pounds. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, we, What's your booth number? Uh, 10204. Okay, and if you'll write the name of your company yeah. and then sign it. Once we rolled it in, it was, uh, it was kind of exciting to, uh, to see it actually moving with the body panels, uh, you know, through uh, great distances. And, uh, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then when we finally got it there, I don't think we had a moment of just us in the car because people started coming over wondering what it was. I'm a little apprehensive about coming into the limelight. Like, like, look at this show. Look at this show. The registration room was as big as the Winnipeg car show, okay? That's just where people register. <laughs> as big as the whole car show in Winnipeg. Just before we left Winnipeg for Las Vegas, Stratasys, the company that printed our plastic body panels, put out a press release over the internet calling Irby the first car ever printed in 3D. And the reaction to that press release was shocking. It blew up all over the internet, and uh, and there's uh, there's pictures across the world of Irby, and uh, and had just great headlines uh, saying first 3D printed car in the world, and uh, and watch out Prius, and watch out uh, all these competitors because Irby's here. I'm sitting here in the Stratasys booth, and uh, and it means uh, it means a lot to me to see. Uh, the Irby vehicle here. It's a, kind of a real surprise, actually. And an honor, honor I guess. Uh, we finally have our fender. This is the full detailed fender uh, from uh, Stratasys. It was uh, printed and shipped here to Las Vegas. And this is all printed in one piece. So along with the la latch mechanism. So it's been a, a, a huge breakthrough. And uh, I don't think there's been a part printed like this before. 
the general reaction has been unbelievably positive. Uh, I can't. I I keep saying unbelievable because I can't believe we're here. I can't believe these parts are going together, and manufacturers are coming by to us, and we're not going to them. On the second day of SEMA, we received yet another unbelievable surprise. America's largest news network wanted to interview us live on national TV. What happened was um, we got an email, a lot of emails today, but the one right. that the one that stuck out, of course, was <laughs> CNN. <laughs> you kind of go, okay. <laughs> When there's cars, people would die for at SEMA, and uh, and CNN calls and wants your car on uh, on their show. It's definitely exciting. Are they talking about on camera? I assume not on the phone or anything. No, what they're talking about is they're finding a studio in Las Vegas. Do you have a date yet for this? Yep, uh, it's, it's uh, 10, tomorrow. It's 10:45 tomorrow morning. Today's big eye. We're going to show you a car that has been designed using a 3D printing method. It's called the Irby. This is it behind me. This is a rapid prototype model coming from the computer file. So this is the first time we see it in real. And this is quite normal. So, so that is process. the model that is generated by that, that computer file, that CAD wow. file that goes through that's, that machine. Yeah. Wow. The new thing that's happening is we're going to make these panels now full scale. So they actually become the panels on mm -hmm. the body. And we, and we have a panel to show you. We're going to show you this uh, quarter panel on the inside yep. here. And here's the, uh, here's the full scale. The story was just as important as the car. Everyone was excited to hear where we came from and, uh, and where we're going to go with it. You know, the people at SEMA were amazing. I never would have dreamt that people would be so interested in what we were doing. We were absolutely overwhelmed by the reaction to Irby in Las Vegas and couldn't wait to get home to Winnipeg and share our experience with the rest of our group. The Ermi Hybrid is being developed by Core Ecologic and Stratasys. The full-scale prototype is not complete yet, but all of the exterior components, including the glass, will be printed through an additive manufacturing technology. Not only will this car be printed into existence, but it seems that it's going to be quite a nice car, too. Las Vegas had us all re-energized. And the reaction we received brought us confidence and the renewed sense of purpose. After months of getting by on a shoestring or no budget at all, we hope to finally capitalize on our momentum and finally have some real dollars to work with. We've got a whole bunch of letters where, where companies are saying right in the email, you need any help, we're there. So, yes. so we used to call for sponsors, they're just all coming at us now. I'd say once an hour we had someone who was some kind of a lead decision maker of a multi-million dollar company and interested in the Irby and not not the, just the 3D printing but the actual car and the ethics behind it and, uh, and the energy of the group. We want to go for, you know, two million dollars to take it to the next level and, and do you want to give away 10% of the company to these investors or are we at that point yet or do we wait longer? What I think we need, as a group, um, is a million in the bank. Not a million promised and not a million coming, but a million in the bank. Before SEMA, we were known somewhat to our sponsors and to a, a local group of people. Uh, afterwards, I think we were known worldwide. It was just uh, an explosion of publicity. The way I describe this project is uh, we were rubbing sticks together for 15 years and um, and then about two years ago we started seeing some smoke and uh, we went to Vegas and we saw fire. We did our best to keep that fire burning over the next few months, but despite our best efforts, it slowly died. The disappointing truth was that despite our optimism, we were still unable to secure any major financial support for Irby. Well, honestly, coming coming back from SEMA, I just thought there's no way this thing's not going to go now. There's just way too much interest. Somebody's going to step up. Somebody's going to want to help us. There was a lot of um, euphoria uh, after that show. Um, there was uh, considerable confidence that doors would be opened. Your emotions start running into overdrive the adrenaline starts pumping and you're thinking this is going to happen and you start getting pumped up I let those emotions get away on me and then when it doesn't happen you you crash pretty low 
Were you discouraged at any point? Absolutely. Not only that point, but uh, many points since. How you get through these dips and valleys that these kind of projects uh, throw at you is only as a group. As an individual, you'd throw in the towel, you'd say, that's it, screw it, I'm done. One of the th things I've learned from the Irby project is to keep those emotions in check. You know, it's pretty cool when CNN calls you for an interview. It's pretty cool at SEMA and uh, taking part in that. But understand what that is. That's something else. It's over here. Irby is over here and it needs to have. You need, you, there's a job that needs finishing. Eventually I did go back to working full time. How did it change my work on Irby? Monday nights were still open. So we went back to working on it Monday nights. You want to try putting batteries in here? Just like that? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I do have to look up the battery cables for the and you're connecting the batteries. Over the spring and summer of 2011, we returned to working on Irby, and we reconvened the Monday night meetings once again, just as John had said we would. We did our best to keep Irby in the public eye, and to promote ourselves in the media as well. Jim Core, founder of Core Ecologic, is with us, and, and uh, with him is uh, Dave Bernhardt. He's an industrial designer, also over at Core Ecologic. Uh, thanks for joining us tonight, gentlemen. Really appreciate you taking uh, time out of your very, very busy schedules. We're gonna unveil it now, and you just say what you you you, you, you think when you see it. Okay? Sounds so, good. So, so here it is. Oh my word! That is amazing. That is amazing. Uh, this is this is beautiful. This is absolutely beautiful. <laughs> I should say the TEDx Winnipeg talk is it September fifteenth. Uh, that's at the art gallery, and we will be displaying the car in the foyer. I was invited to give one of the first ever TEDx talks to be delivered in Winnipeg. TED Talks, which promote technology, entertainment, and design, are broadcast on the internet and known worldwide for promoting innovative ideas. There's a legitimacy uh, when you can say that you have TEDx talk about what you're doing. People who know about TEDx raise their eyebrows and they're impressed. What better place to unveil Irby than to a sold-out audience right here in our hometown? TEDx was important. It was the, the first time that our vehicle would be seen since, uh, since SEMA in a, in a public release. And it was the first time that I wanted it to be seen uh, complete. You got it. leading up to this, so it's a, it's a big moment. Like taking it to SEMA for the first time. You'll see a huge smile on my face when he lays on the first coat. What are your concerns right now as you're going into doing this? I'm concerned. I, I think I got the right speech and I got the right slides. I got the right story. I, I got the right thing I want to convey. I just worry that I'm not going to convey it like you said. That, and that comment with enthusiasm, I can feel that, but I can't just seemingly uh, turn up the enthusiasm, right? And, and uh, when you go to an execution, you're not very enthusiastic, right? <laughs> you're not, you know, it's not like, oh boy, <laughs> last meal. <laughs> Today I'm gonna to talk about the rational car for the next century. Our goal was to create the greenest car in the world. 
and put one in every driveway in the world. We called it Urbi because uh, it's an urban electric car and we thought that every urban center would benefit from a car like this. Think of uh, this uh, Urbi as perhaps the Model T of the 21st century or perhaps the Volkswagen Beetle. These were very frugal cars that, that had a worldwide popularity. And as far as transportation goes, and the car specifically, I use horsepower as my guide. True progress is when you have less horsepower, not more. If you have a big car, uh, you're gonna use about this much energy per day on those kind of trips. And if you have a mid-sized car, you're gonna use about this much energy on those trips. And uh, if you ever buy our car one day, you'd use about this much energy. Okay, and what's inside of Irby? Two people sitting, one the driver. We cover those people with the most aerodynamic body we can think of. It has a pointed tail. We truncate the tail uh, to make it more practical. We add three wheels because we don't need the fourth wheel. We make the rear wheel steering so that the underneath of the car is, stays completely aerodynamic. We power the two front wheels with some electric motors. We put the batteries in the right place to get a nice uh, balance to the vehicle. And we add a small little internal combustion engine for emergencies and for on the highway. And when you add that all together, it looks something like this. When we pulled that curtain off after Jim's speech to an audience of 300 people who just went ecstatic and couldn't wait to you know, come and take a look at it. And uh, yeah, that, that feeling was amazing. And I remembered all the photos going off and everybody taking pictures and I'm going, oh my goodness, I think we just unveiled Irby to uh, Manitoba. To do it in Winnipeg to our hometown crowd and I think it's the first time that I was ever really recognized in Winnipeg to be a serious venture. Our entire team was overwhelmed by the reaction to the unveiling at TEDx and overcome with relief that we had finally finished the first prototype. And a few days later, we took Irby out for a team celebration and a final test run. This project is, is more than just a about a car, it's about a, a great bunch of friends that uh, um, we've all got our own special talents and our own uh, our own quirks. But uh, I think through this project, I've probably met some of the best people in the world. The project seems to attract just amazingly good people. That's what I like about it. I think that's what we'll all kind of remember about. It. You're going to control the speed. Don't do a no, speed run. Oh, just go slow. That I think Jim, as I guess the, the leader of the group, is just uh, an unbelievable role model for uh, for all of us. The group that we've assembled is is remarkable. Um, what we've accomplished on very little funding is unbelievable when you step back and look at it. And uh, um, the talent, the dedication, unbelievable. We're probably better known throughout the U.S. than we are in Winnipeg. We've been to many shows where it almost felt like we were celebrities because people were just coming to the show to see the car. Uh, yet when uh, we talk about it here in Winnipeg, everyone says, well, oh, that's nice. To be frank, we have not had the kind of reaction locally that I think we deserve at times. We could sit back and look at all those people who, uh, who said that it could be done and just say, yep. You said it could be done, but we've done it. I just want to see a second prototype. A friend of mine used to say that Rev A of every design sucks. <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't say Rev A of this design sucks, but uh, I think Rev B will be uh, infinitely better. The second prototype takes quite a bit more funding than the first for, for various reasons. That's Irby 2. Irby 2. And if we got in the order of, like, say, a million dollars or some number like that, then Kirby 2, it would be a distinct possibility. I'd like to see it happen. I'd like to see it happen here in Manitoba.
we're known for being very quiet about what things go on in Winnipeg. I would like to see Manitoba make some noise. This is a project that I, I believe should happen. This is a car that we should all be driving. Well, someone is going to make a car like this because uh, the world just has to start using less energy. And uh, I'd like that uh, to be us.